Thank you, Steve, and the organizers uh, for giving me this chance to say a few things, and I will try in true Margulian uh, style to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, I, just as a reference, I started at BU in the fall of 1977, and I had the opportunity to actually witness symbiosis going from, as she would say, something not to be discussed in polite company to being dogma. Um, during that time, Lynn, I, she, the most wonderful day of my life was when she invited me to join her lab. That was in the spring of 1978. And then later when she was the chair of the National Academy Committee that was uh, charged with fig telling NASA what they were going to do for the next year and uh, 10 years and created the Planetary Biology Program, okay, she hired me as her aide de camp and I learned a lot of different things. So I'm going to just quickly go. Number one, she literally opened the world to me. My first time in a plane ever was flying out to the NASA second post-Viking meeting. I was absolutely amazed. She gave me her bicycle because I was staying at Stanford and had to bicycle from Stanford campus in the dorms to, to NASA Ames. Two, it was seek the expertise. Work with the people who are doing the cutting edge stuff. I learned my microscopy from David Chase. Third, don't be intimidated as being her aide de camp, I had to get on the phone and hassle people, very famous people, for their uh, contributions to this document she was working on, including Hall Harlan Halverson, who was at the time the president of the American Society of Microbiology. She says, John, you have to call him. And I called him and I said, Dr. Halverson, uh, you, you have to give this chapter to Lynn. And he says, John, I know what you're doing, but tell Lynn, get off my back. Four, don't let bureaucracy get in the way of your science. I had to deal with the grants, and one of them was, uh, had to deal with a person in the accounting office at BU whose favorite word was, I'm not going to Leavenworth for Lynn. <laughs> Five, challenge dogma, and don't, uh, challenge dogma and trust your observations. One of the most important things I had to do was tell Lynn that there was no microcolius in the Baja mats in 1979 and she didn't believe me, and I was right. And then lastly, never give up or lose your enthusiasm for science. Whether it's getting a grant turned down or a paper uh, rejected, you just keep going. Lynn, I will miss you dearly. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks a lot for including me. Um, I, think, uh, I think I've known Lynn since 1966, when I was six years old. Um, our, uh, I hung out a lot with, with Dorian and Jeremy back in the day. Our, uh, our fathers were really close friends. They were both Harvard professors. And so we started spending time together and became really good friends. And uh, so I'd go hang out on the uh, big house up on uh, Gibbs Avenue, and I think it was in Newton Center. And um, so I first knew Lynn as, uh, as uh, a mother figure, just the, the mother of my, my good friends. Um, but it was, it was a really interesting um, household to hang out in. And, um, well, I remember uh, uh, Dorian and Jeremy and I, uh, they, we uh, published a, a magazine called Jerk, a humor magazine. It was probably the best magazine ever written. Unfortunately, no copies are known to exist, which only increases its, the size of its myth. And we, um, Lynn was very tolerant and up to a point supportive of some of our early alchemical experiments. I, I remember one time we um, tried to make birch beer out of birch trees, but we didn't really know how to do it. Uh, we di didn't kill ourselves or anything. And we did other experiments involving various forms of combustion. And um, anyway, she, she was very, uh, very tolerant and reasonably supportive of these activities. But then um, as, uh, as time went on and I got a little bit older, uh, I, I started to become more aware of who Lynn was and what she did. And, and um, one thing I, I really appreciate is the way that she spoke to kids very respectfully. And I, as I uh, got a little bit older and, and um, as, as a uh, sort of early teenager was interested in science, I still remember some conversations I had with her at that age uh, because her, her um, innate um, interest in teaching and her innate ability to share excitement uh, was something that was was very much present, and um, I would have to say, you know, at least partially responsible for the uh, the path that I've taken in my life, becoming a, a professional planetary scientist and astrobiologist. Um, now, fast forward to um, the last time 
I got to uh, spend any significant time with Lynn was, um, I guess, about a decade ago at the, um, the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, which was um, really fun, an interesting combination of intellectual meeting and sort of playful and culinary and experiential and um, foraging in the woods, uh, a really good time. And, um, but I remember I hadn't seen Lynn in quite some time, and during, during my talk, um, I, I made a, a slight error, um, and uh, I, I, I briefly confused um, uh, Svant Arrhenius with Gustav Arrhenius. And, I, um, and out of the darkness came this terrifying voice in the middle of my talk going, Svant! It's Svant Arrhenius! And it was, it was genuinely frightening. Um, but then I have to say that uh, we, we did get to spend time that weekend, and it was really fun. Dorian and Antonio were there too, and, and uh, Dorian gave a, uh, a mushroom magic show that was terrific. And uh, Tonio was the first time I heard uh, Tonio's poetry. Um, so I, I really remember and, and seeing her in that context as the, the matriarch of this tremendously creative family was, was really something. And I think in some ways the, the uh, confluence of people that are here today in all the different communities um, speaks to all the different ways that Lynn was, was a matriarch, not just of that family, but of many families that we're all part of and sort of symbiotically interacting and, uh, and evolving as, as we must continue to do as best we can without her. Um, fast forward to, to one more time. The last time I saw Lynn in person um, was uh, Slightly over a year ago, somebody else, uh, Lynn Rothschild, mentioned that there was an event for uh, celebrate 50 years of exobiology at NASA. Um, and Lynn was rightly honored at that event for uh, being such a founding, um, of such founding importance and continuing importance in the, in the origin and evolution of exobiology and later astrobiology as a discipline. Uh, and it, it was thrilling because um, Margulis and Lovelock and all these other notables were there. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's really an exciting time in exobiology, astrobiology right now because we're in the midst of this exoplanet revolution where, uh, you know, up until a few years ago, we imagined that all the stars in the sky perhaps had planets, but we didn't know. But now we know that when you look at a, at a, at a star, at, at a sky full of stars, that most of those stars have planets around them. And so naturally this um, heightens our, um, our work and our speculation about uh, where we might be able to find life in the universe. And my own career has been much uh, about trying to understand the evolution of planets and the implication for, for habitability on other planets. And I have to say, though, that the people as of now working on exoplanets and thinking about habitability are stuck a little bit maybe in the, the pre, um, pre-Gaian mode of um, thinking of planets and life very mechanically where life is maybe something that happens on a planet, but not necessarily something that happens to a planet. And, and I think that's wrong, and, and that if we're really going to understand habitability, we need to think, um, as Lynn did, of the, the uh, complex relationship between a planet and its environment. And if it were up to me, the, the writings of, of Dorian Sagan and, and Lynn Margulis would be required reading for everybody working on exoplanets right now. But anyways, as I was, I was, as I was giving that talk um, at that meeting, I, um, I was sort of avoiding looking at Lynn. She was right in the front row, and I was just, I didn't want her to make me nervous. There's still, you know, somebody who's ever, you've felt that sort of parental thing about, even though it was decades and decades earlier, you don't entirely lose that. So I was sort of looking off the distance and not looking at her, but at one point I made some statement about the relationship between a planet and the evolution of life, and I couldn't help but realize, well, I'm, I'm talking about this, but Margulis and Lovelock are, are sitting right there. And, and I looked at her, and she just had this look on her face where she was smiling and nodding and, and being so encouraging. And I just felt like she was communicating to me, yes, keep going. And that, um, that love and nurturing and encouragement I'll always remember. And um, I think that, that that's the way I want to remember Lynn and, uh, and uh, her ability to encourage all of us to keep going. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, really lovely to be here. Uh, so I'd just like to begin by expressing my condolences to uh, Lynn's family and friends and colleagues. Many of the people at this tribute knew Lynn far better than I, and moreover, I'm not a scientist, and compared to many people here, I know little about symbiogenesis, evolutionary theory, and Gaia. I am, by training, a sociologist. Lynn liked to say to me that science deals with facts, and all else is he said, she said. 
She might smile to know how many times that single comment has resonated with me since I left my glorious sabbatical year here in her laboratory and returned to the familiarity, the all too familiarity of my own discipline. I learned a tremendous amount during my sabbatical year. Lynn and her laboratory colleagues, many of whom are here, shared generously of their time, allowing me to join their lunchtime conversations, trail them around the laboratory, um, go to seminars with them, um, audit their courses, and generally participate in the many conversations about evolution and the like. I don't need to reiterate um, the impact Lynn's extraordinary opus of work has had on the Academy, as well as environmental social movements. What I will say is that her work has had a profound effect on the direction of my own research, which has moved towards science and environmentalism, thanks largely to my exposure to Lynn's work and the diverse range of authors that her work synthesizes. Beyond her phenomenal Renaissance-like sorry, <laughs> uh, intellectualism. I've had a pause to reflect upon Lynn as a woman scholar. This is something Lynn and I only ever talked about sporadically and in passing. It quite rightly rankled her to be characterized as a great woman scientist, and I blanched more than once reading quotes from some of her male contemporaries who critique suffer in no small part by their unwillingness to acknowledge their debt to sexism. I will say that I just had lunch with Richard Dawkins last week, and uh, Lynn came up, but I'll save that for another time, perhaps over wine. Um, so um, in her book, I, in the book that I wrote about um, my time here, I devoted only one sentence to the subject of Lynn's gender out of respect for the fact that it wasn't something she emphasized. Nevertheless, it's something I find myself returning to, not only as I navigate my own environment, but as I'm, as I'm increasingly solicited to provide some sort of compass for my female junior colleagues and graduate and undergraduate students. The first time I saw Lynn in person was at an invited presentation she gave at McMaster University in Canada. I arrived late to the presentation having gotten lost and I was nursing my two month old son who had cried for most of the several hour traffic jam journey to Hamilton. I sat at the back of the large and full auditorium next to two male PhD students. And these students spent their time openly smirking and poking fun at Lynn's presentation. And they were clearly not keen to have a woman nursing her baby next to them. What was I doing there? Their pointed looks at me said. At the Q&A at the end, one of these men quickly raised his hand and asked one of those all too familiar questions that are really statements. He triumphantly sat down maintaining his sneer. And I watched Lynn simply, directly and without pause decimate his challenge. Now this was someone I wanted to get to know. I can only imagine how many more such encounters Lynn faced throughout her life as she challenged people to think creatively and differently about the world. History is punctuated with accounts of intelligent women who become strong in order to survive inhospitable milieu. Lynn was a strong, smart, at times astonishingly honest, complex woman who built an extraordinary and unique life. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try not to cry too. Um, it isn't science until you communicate it, said Lynn. And of course, that was her advice to graduate students, a warning that we must get our theses done and then published in a journal, subjected to peer review. Otherwise, we were not doing science. It isn't science until you communicate it. But she also meant that science is intrinsically collaborative and requires many levels of communication. It's not a solitary practice. And so, on that day of her stroke in November, many fold communications of people in this room and of people the world over with Lynn were cut off as though in mid sentence, never to connect again. Maybe that week you had planned to reply to one of her emails, but had not yet. Maybe you owed her a chapter for a book. 
get it in, please. Maybe you were about to send back revisions for a paper you were writing with her, like Martin, or had a gift for her, like Penny. Maybe you had a half-written letter, handwritten letter, which she would enjoy, to finish, and needed to finish it and mail it to her. And maybe you were going to show her those specimens, those photos that you had been saving for her. Maybe you had lunch plans, lecture plans, plans for a little trip. Regrets for all those unfinished communications. Regrets, no regrets is what I believe Lynn would say, but rather be grateful that we were left with so many connections and communications still to be made and we are still here and alive and are obliged to keep the communications alive. It is not that things were left unsaid, but rather that Lynn left us with so much yet to be said and to celebrate. <laughs>